Hi everybody! I haven't done a video in a while and I wanted to do one on my diagnosis history for this mystery illness that I dealt with for a number of years. So if you want to play along, make guesses while I was making guesses, feel free. And I'm just going to tell you kind of what happened. So I woke up one day in 2005 and decided to go back to school. I decided that what I was doing with my career uh, wasn't enough for me and I needed to have more meaning and purpose in my life. And I wanted to work with community and I wanted to do something that was, uh, yeah, challenging, more challenging than what I was doing. So the next year, sometime in late fall or early winter, I got sick and my throat swole up to the side of my jaw and I was tired and I had a little bit of a fever. Anyhow, I went into the school clinic to have them check it out. They tested me for mono, it came back negative, but the doctor decided to put me on prednisone to help with the giant swelling and then, you know, just wished me well on getting better because it seemed to be some kind of unidentified viral illness. Well, it took me a while to get over that illness. I was falling over and bumping into walls, and I was kind of clumsy, and I lost some of the flexibility that I used to have in my knees and some of the strength that I had, but I did finally get better. Or so it seemed. In fall of 2007, I was training for my third degree black belt. I was out running at least three times a week and attending classes and working out, uh, lifting weights and things like that. And one day while I was out jogging, I got a stitch in my side. So I thought, you know what, I'm, I'm in great shape right now the best cardiovascular shape I've ever been in in my life and I, I'll do fine on the test. I can take a week off. And I took a week off and I just kind of chilled and whatever and when I went to go back and start working out again, I weighed myself and I had lost 15 pounds. For someone who struggled with weight loss as a young adult, that 15 pounds just evaporating off my body without me noticing was kind of surprising. So I had been planning this trip with my sisters to Japan and I had already paid for the flight and the, everything. And I was thinking that crazy weight loss and everything, I, I might die whatever was going on, but I didn't want to miss out on that trip. So, so I visited the health clinic and they said to come back if I kept losing weight like that. And they did some tests and the tests just came back negative. So I did go on that trip. Um, I was still having problems with pain and I started to develop problems with eating. And when I got back, I had lost more weight. In fact, by the end of the month, I had lost 40 pounds. And I went back and saw the doctor and went back and saw the doctor. And every time that I got into the scale, I was just feel, filled with dread and one day I started to cry because I was so frustrated. Why was I still losing weight like crazy? Why was I having problems eating? And uh, my doctor, Esme Anderson, threatened that she would have me walk onto it backwards like she did with her, uh, some of her patients with eating disorders uh, because it caused me so much stress. Anyhow, 
they couldn't figure it out with simple blood tests and other things, so I got sent to specialists. And they did an ultrasound of my gallbladder to see if that was it. And it wasn't. And they sent me in for a HIDA scan to see if there was something going on with the way things were flowing through me, and that wasn't it. And in the end, I got sent to a gastroenterologist, uh, Dr. Thorpe, and he thought it might be uh, stomach cancer or something like that, and they did an upper endoscopy. It was clear. And I went on a gluten-free diet, and I documented every single thing I ate to make sure that I didn't in any way possibly contaminate uh, my, my intake with gluten to see if that would help. And it didn't. And they also tested me for celiac, and it came back negative. And I was wondering maybe if maybe I had Crohn's. I, I didn't know. But Dr. Thorpe, he said to me, we're just shooting in the dark. We don't know. Your, your symptoms are too general for us to figure out. You're going to have to get a lot sicker for us to be able to tell. But don't worry. It's, it's not deadly. So... I just felt hopeless. I, I had kept losing weight. I went back to Esme Anderson and said what he had told me, and she said, that's not acceptable. So if they can't figure it out, we're going to treat symptoms. So she got me on some stuff to help with my uh, indigestion and eating problems and, and gut pain and with my low iron and with uh, the hypoglycemia that had become so severe, especially with the weight loss. And so I started doing a hypoglycemic diet where I would eat every two to three hours, just small amounts, high fiber, high protein, um, and eliminating most simple carbohydrates and sugars out to try to stabilize my blood sugar um, to help me combat the fatigue and the shakiness that I was feeling. And eventually I did seem to stabilize to some degree. In 2009 in January, I was at work. I sat down and there was a popping, cracking noise and some shooting pain, but it wasn't too horrible. So I didn't think much of it. I thought maybe I had cracked a joint and there was a nerve there or something. Well, the next day when I came in for work, uh, the pain started to get much worse. And I went in to talk to the facility manager on my way out and he sent me over to the work clinic. And at the work clinic, the pain just was getting worse and worse and worse. Um, they tried doing uh, electro uh, therapy where they run the, the impulse through you to try to get the pain to calm down and it didn't. Uh, they tried to stick me up on a, get me to climb up on a bed to get an x-ray and I couldn't because I was in so much pain. The nurse eventually, he just picked me up and put me up on top. And I couldn't even lay on my back with my legs straight. And eventually I got sent into the ER and was dosed up on morphine, which didn't do a lot for the pain, but it made it really hard to focus. And at the ER, they ended up doing a CT scan and poking and prodding me until I did my best in my drugged up state to scream to stop and nothing. They couldn't figure it out. So I was sent home with a bunch of medication and uh, I found out that way that uh, opiates don't really work for pain for me. And I, an ice pack and some ibuprofen would do wonders. Anyhow, 
a couple months later, the bottom of my feet started to itch. And I started to itch a lot. So I started taking Benadryl every night to help me sleep uh, just once a day. And I had some relationship problems at the time and my anxiety was just getting worse and worse. I hadn't had it since childhood and it had come back and I didn't know how to manage it. Anyhow, that summer I went on a trip to Europe to do study abroad for school and it was really hard to pay for it because all of my money had been taken to pay for expenses at the ER, which hadn't shown me anything. And I will be forever grateful to Chris Clark in helping me find uh, monetary resources so I could still go. And while I was there in Europe, I was in a lot of pain and uh, it was hard to walk, especially stairs were really difficult. But by the end of the month, I could walk and I could walk without pain. And I thought, well, maybe, maybe I'm beyond this problem. In 2010, after I graduated, uh, I went on an inter internship to California and I had a recurrence of the back pain. And at the time I was taking gummy vitamins to see if that would help me because I was taking the medication for my guts that made it so that I didn't absorb nu nutrients as well. And I was taking uh, Nexium and I was taking the Benadryl and my anxiety just got worse while I was there. I had a panic attack one night and I tried to calm myself down but it just kept getting worse. I ended up going on a really long walk and just crying. Anyhow, when I got back home I started to have chest pains and I would wake up at night and I'd have a headache and it just really, really hurt, like my heart was in pain. And I remember getting up and looking on the computer to see, all right, <laughs> all right, magic of Google, what could be wrong? What causes chest pain and headache? And I couldn't figure it out and I would fall asleep on the couch and I thought, okay, I'm going to have to go see a doctor again. I don't really want to, but this, this is bad. Well, that Monday, uh, the furnace guy came by to update the furnace, put in a new filter and stuff, and found out that our furnace was leaking carbon monoxide. And I had carbon monoxide poisoning. So he turned off our furnace, and that night I didn't wake up in pain. I didn't know back then that uh, there's not really a lot they can do for carbon monoxide poisoning. So I went into the clinic and I talked to uh, Dr. Fernandez and I told him about the carbon monoxide poisoning and the itching problems and the anxiety that was bothering me. And he put me on hydroxyzine for the anxiety and itching and a cream to put on my feet for the itching to help. And hydroxyzine did amazing things for my itching and it was great. It didn't touch my anxiety. And when I finished it, the itching came back. So I just 
kept going the way I'd been going for years. In 2012, I was working with a local haunted house, Castle of Chaos, doing makeup on the actors and the talent that was there. And while I was doing this airbrush makeup, these guys were coming in and out that were smokers, um, and they come in and the smoke, I would smell it, and I'd just start coughing. And oh, I thought, man, I, I didn't realize my aller allergy to smoke had gotten so bad in all these years, but I got pretty annoyed about it, and I, I then thought it over and thought, you know, maybe it's not so good that I'm inhaling all of these fumes from the airbrush makeup. My brother got me a respirator for Christmas, and I started wearing that, and it definitely seemed to help which was great. So in 2013, Obamacare came along and I decided to hop onto that. I was kind of resentful at first because I was struggling financially, but at the same time, I knew that with my health issues, which were so troubling, that I really needed to be able to have affordable health care even if it took every penny that I earned. So I was not feeling so great and I went to see a primary care provider for the first time in years and he put me on an antibiotic because of one of the results of a blood test that I had but he never told me you know like what it was or anything. He was just like okay you've got a little bit of a fever and uh, some of your blood tests shows that you have some kind of infection, so I'm going to put you on this and you should be fine. And I took it, and he never followed up with me. In 2013, or excuse me, in 2014, in, in uh, the early spring, I went on another trip to Japan. The, I was so excited. I'd saved up a lot of money, so, you know, I paid for the super cheap plane ticket and the super cheap housing, and we really did know how to do Japan on the cheap, the cheap. So it was, the whole trip was like 2200 something like that. And while I was there, it got so bad, I couldn't eat the food and I had back pain, which had forced me to stop doing karate years earlier. And I got so scared and frustrated. And when I came back, I just had this horrible, sick feeling that just got worse. So I went to see a doctor again and my previous doctor had retired that I had only seen the once. So I saw somebody new and I told him about the eating problems and not feeling great and uh, he, uh, he sent me to a dermatology specialist because I had a bite on my leg that wasn't clearing up and when I went in to see the dermatology guy I had another thing pop up on my neck and he took a sample of that and sent it off to the lab and it came back negative so he told me it was no big deal but uh, with my blood test, he decided that I probably had erythema nodosum, which you may have heard of by its more, or not erythema nodosum, erythema migrans, which you may know by its more common name, Lyme disease. So I was given this dose of antibiotics to take, and at the end, I wasn't better. So he switched the diagnosis, I went in, I should back up. I went to a friend's wedding reception 
and when I arrived, I felt this horrible pain down at the bottom of my leg. And when I looked, I had this patch of skin that had swollen up and was hard. Not like something that's swollen, but like a rock or something that uh, is, is tangibly not liquid and not flesh. And it hurt a lot. So yeah, I went back to the dermatologist and I showed him my leg and talked to him about how the antibiotic didn't seem to work. And he switched my diagnosis to erythema nodosum, which I think is some kind of inflammatory condition that can happen after an illness. And he got me some medication to help me with that. And it was six months of medication. And he said, you know, take this, you'll get better. You don't need to come back to see me. Don't worry about it. And if it pops up again, just start taking it again. So I took it and I took it every day for six months. And during this time, I started to have lymph nodes swell up and go down and swell up and go down and swell up and go down. And I changed jobs around this time. And I noticed that during the holiday season, uh, my throat was really irritated and I had this cough. And I thought it was irritation from all those chemicals that they put on the Christmas stuff, which I still think are gross. But anyway, I, I would cough a lot at work and my throat was really dry. And I thought, oh gosh, can't wait for that to be over. And when it when the season was over, it seemed to get better, and then it started to get worse, and a lot worse. I started to have problems breathing all the time, and in 2015, I developed this wheezing cough that if I coughed, I would cough and cough, and it was like I couldn't get enough air and it hurt, and I hurt, and I was getting all sorts of symptoms by this time. In fact, I pulled out a page that I had written down of my symptoms at the time, and this was in May. I have a bite on my left knee. I didn't see the insect, though. I'm very tired. Knee very painful. Feels like a collapsed vein. Can't sleep because of the pain stabbing gut pain, swellings, nausea, exhaustion, right side of throat keeps swelling. I can't walk because of the pain. And at this time, I couldn't sit down or get up from sitting without pushing on stuff. My knees had no strength in them and they were swollen and in a lot of uh, aggravating pain. And then neurological symptoms started to show up. Along with feeling sick, I would get dizzy spells. And if I went out into the sunlight, suddenly all my skin would start to tingle. And I really didn't know what was going on. But by Memorial Day, I was certain that if they didn't figure it out, I was going to die. So I went to see my doctor and he did a chest x-ray and there were points all throughout my lungs. And I went to see the skin doctor about another swelling on another leg that was rock hard and large like that again. And he pulled in a bunch of doctors and we all sat there and chatted for a while. And he, he said, okay, I'm gonna try to help you get your diagnosis. So they sat there and discussed, okay, what possibly do you think this could be with these symptoms and what's been going on and one of the things that they ended up testing for, 
along with five others, um, and came back positive on the blood test was Lyme disease. Again. So I ended up getting sent to an infectious disease doctor, Dr. Abolnik, who, I mean, he's great. This is this uh, guy from Russia, and he still has this thick dialect after all these years, very Russian dialect, and nice beard. And it took me forever to get in to see him after I got my referral. It took weeks before I was able to actually get a hold of the receptionist to schedule an appointment. And then after that, it took another three months before I was able to see him. And he looked at all my symptoms and history and told me, I don't know what you have, but it's not Lyme disease. And I just remember feeling absolute despair. If it's not Lyme disease, what can it be? So he said that they were just going to redo all the tests, and they did. I had another CT scan. I had all sorts of blood tests, urine tests, stool tests, and I had high eosinophiles, and I had lesions on my spine and my spleen and elsewhere in my body. And he was having troubles figuring it out too. So one day he looked at me and looked at a giant swelling I had on this side of lymph nodes and asked me how long it had been there. And I said, for a month. And he said, let's take a look at that, but I'm not going to do it because it's in such a sensitive area. And he sent me to Kip Robbins, who did the surgery. And he gave me a recommendation to a, uh, excuse me, Ugh. to another specialist to see if it had something to do with uh, allergies or arthritis or something like that. But it would take six months before I could see that guy. So anyhow, um, Robbins had me uh, put out completely and he took the sample out. I don't know if you can see, but I've got just a cute little scar there across my carotid artery and sheath where he took out that giant ugly growth on my neck. And when he saw it, he knew exactly what it was. And the next day he called me and he said, I've got a diagnosis for you. Do you want the good news or the bad news? And I just said, I just want to know. And he said, do you want to drive down here to talk? And I said, no, just tell me over the phone. And uh, he said he wanted to wait until he had confirmation from the lab to tell me, but I had Hodgkin's lymphoma. And uh, he said he'd give me a referral to any oncologist that I wanted, and I had no idea. So he sent me to Dr. Breyer, who was wonderful. And nine days after that diagnosis, I started chemo with Dr. Breyer. They rushed everything. They rushed all the tests and getting a port in so I could start right away because I was so sick. And it was an interesting experience because at first, chemo was just kind of a strange amusement when they put the medicine into my port. 
I could feel it kind of like a hot liquid going down inside me. And then I just flushed really bright red. I didn't develop the chemo-induced vomiting until my third visit. And I started to improve in my breathing right away. So I knew they had the right diagnosis and the right treatment. And the day that I was there for chemo, there was this wonderful woman, uh, Jenny the Brave. She had esophageal cancer and they had treated it once and done surgery to get rid of it and it had come back. And at the time she was just doing chemo to try to hold on as long as she could for her kids. And I was sitting next to her and we were chatting. And as I was sitting there, I developed this wave of nausea. And I said, oh, goodness. And she said, uh, do you need something? And I was like, oh, no, no, I think, I think I'm fine. And she was just so wise. She told the nurse to bring me a vomit bag and Thank goodness she did, because about five seconds later, I was spewing my guts. And chemo was rough, but I don't think there's anything as rough as not knowing why you're sick or if you're ever going to get better. And I know there are a lot of you out there who have chronic illnesses that are undiagnosed. And it's like Schrodinger's cat. Is it in the box? Or is it not? Is it alive? Or isn't it? And along with Schrodinger's illness, you also have Schrodinger's treatment. Will this make me better? Or will it never get better? And who's to know? And sometime, somehow we just keep trying our best. And I wish you the best.